is on. Okay. Excuse me, sorry. Okay. Welcome back, everybody, to BC212, our course on Christian apologetics. We are down to the final hour of our lecture. We are dealing with um, social challenges and uh, just creating a biblical framework on how to think about things and then uh, providing a few pointers on different issues. And then we will take up questions that are on the chat, which uh, which have been posted. And I'm sure if there are other questions, people can ask, and we will try to answer them. So let's just uh, pick up from where we pause before the break um, and answer and, and, and move on those those topics. So we were talking about you know how a believer responds or you know, relates to this whole issue of uh, gay marriages, homosexuality, and so on. And we were talking about, we talked about one play, one scenario about a business owner. We can think about another scenario where in the workplace, if you are an HR person, you're supposed to hire people for the organization. People are sending you their resumes. Now, we keep in mind that when you're hiring people, you're hiring based on their skills and not based on their race or marital status or orient sexual orientation. Excuse me. Excuse me, sorry. You know, you're not hiring them based on that. So, um, excuse me. <coughs> oh. Hey, all right, I don't think you can hear me there, so I'll see All right, now let's go back to the class now. Um, so, uh, you know, so as an HR person, in your faith, you don't approve of, uh, you know, somebody who's homosexual, but when you're hiring a person for the organization, you're your responsibility is check their skills. Do they meet the requirement? Do they pass the tests? And then based on that, you make the offer. So that's, you know, you have faith in God. You know what you are. You don't you're not compromising yourself. But the workplace, you're following the instructions, the policies uh, given to you by the organization. Think about if you're a, in an in a, in a, in a, a authority or a government position. And... Uh, if you're a chief minister, what would you do? Well, you have people from all religions, from all backgrounds, and they, or you know, if you're a prime minister or a president, you know, you've got people of all kinds of backgrounds, and you've got to treat everybody fairly. Think about God. He makes the sun to shine on the good and the bad. He gives rain to the good and the bad. He's being fair to everybody, right? So that's how we should operate when we are in those places of leadership. Be fair to all. Uh, you have your conviction about faith in God and what's right and wrong, but in your position as a government official, treat everybody equally. Right? I think about the local church. Now, as a local church, we have the right to say no to conducting gay marriages. Right? It's against the teaching of Scripture. So that's why we, that's within our jurisdiction, that is within our uh, space, we can say, well, we are going to do it like this because the Bible says so. Right? So we have the right to refuse um, gay marriages. Now, you know, I know that's changing in some contexts of Christian, the Christian world, where even churches are, or denominations are okay conducting gay marriages, but actually it's going against the teaching of the scripture. Right? But uh, so as a church we can stand by the teaching of scripture say in our church in, in our sphere we have the right to follow what we believe we will stand by that now if we are persecuted for it that's fine we're going to stand for the truth we don't compromise on the truth think about divorce this is another area where we know god god doesn't approve of divorce uh, but we also know that there are situations where these things will happen 
uh, people go through that situation. Either one's, one spouse is unfaithful, one, one spouse deserts, leaves and abandons the family and disappears, or there's abuse, uh, things like that. So there are these difficult situations. And then how do we respond to that? We are not encouraging divorce. We are going to do our utmost to uh, preserve every marriage. But the divorce does happen. So in that case, what we'll do, we still love the people. We still believe that God is a God of a second chance. He can give them a new beginning and uh, work with them in that direction. You know? So we can't make one person responsible for the actions of another person. If somebody was unfaithful. That was somebody else's action. Right? And so on. So we have to uh, understand that and be, be God-like uh, and redemptive in every situation, even in the case of divorce. Okay. Um, think about abortion. That's another big area. That, yeah, uh, it is the killing of an unborn child. It's the taking away of a life. It is equal and equal to murder. But there will there are situations like you know the case of uh, a rape. Uh, you know, it wasn't that person who wanted to get pregnant, but it was done against her will. And uh, uh, you know, should we allow abortion in that case? Or what if there's a mother who already has a child? She's going to have another child, but her life is in danger. Right? Does she need to live? Of course, she needs to live for the sake of the child that she already has. And so what do you do in a situation like that? Or uh, another situation is, what if uh, the baby in the womb has not been formed properly? There's some abnormality in the doctors because of the tests they do and all that they can warn the, they warn the parents, hey, something's wrong with the child. What do you do? So in all of these situations, we have to look at it from God's perspective. Right? And so if a woman has been violated, becomes pregnant, we leave it to her to make that decision. In some situations, uh, the woman says, OK, I know this has happened against my will, but I will still go out and have the child. Fine. Respect that decision. In some cases, a woman may, woman may say, this has happened against my will. I don't want the child. Fine. You respect that person's decision. You love the person. Similarly, in the case of, you know, when uh, the doctors say, look, the child in the womb, there's some abnormality, we don't force our faith on the parents. We say, okay, you decide. In some situations, parents would say, no, we are going to go through and have the baby and we'll face the consequences. Fine, you respect the decision. In some cases, parents would say, okay, we, we know what the doctor said, therefore we will about the child. Fine. We respect their decision. Right? So we don't want to force faith upon people. We don't want to force to act against their will. We respect, be respectful of, of their decision and so on. But of course, we do not want to uh, abort a baby just you know for every women fancy. No. The child is precious. Uh, and we must respect that. We must respect the life of the unborn child, and, and not, and as far as possible, protect the life of the unborn child. So that's important. Some other social issues, you know, oh, one would be about climate change and environment. Now, even in the Christian world, there are two sides to this. There's one side that says, you know, God. Is going to if the world is going to end up in a mess, and God is going to uh, make new heavens and a new earth. So no matter what we do, the world is going to end up in a mess. So don't worry. Uh, God is in control. Just leave it. Don't bother. Don't waste time and money on trying to protect the environment. And don't worry about climate change. It's not a problem. It doesn't exist. One part of the Christian world speaks like that. Another part of the Christian world says, we are stewards of, the, of this planet. God has put us in charge. And yes, we know that you know, 
the world will be will get you know will grow worse. Things will get worse, and and God is going to make new heavens and new earth. We know what the scripture is saying, but as long as we live, we need to do what we can uh, to protect the environment and to lessen harm whatever we can on climate change and do our part. Be responsible. That's another section. So my personal uh, conviction is that we need to be good stewards, right? Just like you take care of your body. Is this body going to die one day? Of course it's going to die one day. But as long as I can, I need to take care of my body. I need to do what I can with my body, do it well, so that I can live healthy. I know I was going to die, but doesn't mean I'm going to go and destroy it today. No. I'm going to take care of it as long as I can, live as well, as long as I can for the glory of God. I think that same perspective, how you're being stewards of that, being stewards of your time, being stewards of your money, we have to be stewards of the planet. So that's my perspective, my conviction, that that's how we should approach the environment, the planet, the natural resources, and climate change, that we need to do what we can study, research, take action, um, educate, do all the right things to be responsible about the planet. That's my position. If somebody disagrees with me, it's okay. That's their decision, their choice. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to argue, but I believe this is God has put us and made us stewards of everything is entrusted to us. That's our position. The other things, you know, uh, organ transplant. Uh, now, you know, during Bible time, some of these things were not possible. Then nobody did an organ transplant or uh, implant or uh, prosthesis and other things. But in today's world, these things are possible. So, what about organ transplant? Taking the organ from one human being to another, or in some cases, they've even tried from an animal to another. You know, they're trying that. What about those kinds of things? Well, uh, what about surrogacy, where you know, uh, if a couple finds it difficult to have a child um, for whatever reason, then they have another human, another woman carry the baby in her form uh, uh, for this for this other couple. You know, what what about that? Um, what about genetics and gene editing and genetic modification? Uh, of course, it has already been done for the improvement of the quality of life, where you can modify the genes of plants or vegetation so that uh, you can, you know, make them grow in conditions they cannot grow otherwise, or you can modify the the, the, the fruits and so on and so forth uh, to be resistant to pests and other things and so on uh, for the benefit of human life. Or what about? gene editing and genetic modification for the treating of heal and healing of sicknesses so that that you can actually get in and edit the genes that are causing those problems so these things were not there during bible times and so how do we respond to these kinds of things that we are seeing happen in our world today again here i'm sharing my personal thoughts you know i can't give a chapter and verse uh, i'm coming from that biblical framework that we had created or set up earlier, saying that, look, if it's going to be for the good of people without hurting people, then it's fine. So if you're going to you know, work uh, in genetics so that you can produce better crops or increase harvest or better fruit or whatever, it's for the good of people, fine, do it. Uh, it's okay. This again, my perspective. You can, you're free to disagree with me on this, but I feel it's fine. If surrogacy again, if somebody else is bearing children for somebody, uh, where you know the 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 the, the egg or the uh, the fertilized egg is implanted in the womb, you know, and, and they bear it, is it is it is it good for somebody? Yeah, it's for the good of somebody. I find nothing wrong with it. God has given us the technology, the means to do something good. Use it. Right? So organ transplant. If it's going to help, fine. Right? What about transferring from an animal to a human? Well, that's a little far-fetched. Uh, it's probably going against 
the natural way they got created things so i would say stay out of it but from human to human yeah it's going to help somebody fine and people's lives have been extended uh, because of that a good thing right so these are these are not chapters and verses but these are just my perspective on how to look at these things so how to think about these things if it's doing good without hurting somebody fine but when somebody's being hurt, that's when we have to be careful. Or when we're going against the natural way that God designed things, that's when we have to be careful. And I know there's a gray area there, you know, you're, but I feel that the knowledge and uh, technology that God has given to us, if we can use it for good, then definitely we should be okay with that. But again, these are areas that we need to think about. Um, think about you know what's going on with murder, war, and genocide. Um, this is happening all over the world, different places. Um, how do we look at it? Well, murder is wrong. God doesn't want us to take away the life of another human being. Now, in war, in order to protect a country, yes, people kill, and that's not sin. You're protecting your country. You're protecting the citizens of your nation. That's not sin. You're you're, you're you're doing a work in order to protect your country against people who are attacking or people who are meaning to do harm. But what about killing innocent people? What about killing civilians? What about uh, killing people because they don't belong to your same race or things like that? That's not right. right? If you're killing, you're protecting your country and engaging in war, yeah, that's fine. But to go and kill people because uh, they are just uh, different from you. That's not right. Now, in the Old Testament, um, when God had directed his people to go occupy territory, occupy the land of Canaan, there was conflict. They ended up killing people. That's, that's different. The context was you have to take over this territory. If they submit to you willingly, fine. But if they resist, that's when you conquer. So the, the motivation was different. In in today's world, that's no longer there. It's not about going and taking territory. But if you're destroying lives uh, uh, because they are of a different race or of a different persuasion, that's uh, not right. So like this, there are other things that we can talk about, you know, corruption in government. How do we deal with it? Uh, civil law and faith. What? How should believers interact with government? Uh, what about some of the things we see in our country, like caste system, dowry, yoga, those kinds of things? So, in all of these things, we have to think through and uh, apply that biblical framework. So, let me just make a few comments here. We'll take questions after that. So, in uh, Corruption, uh, of course, that's wrong. We cannot be participants to that. But sometimes people are oppressed. That means uh, there is extortion. That means people forcibly take things away from you. So you can't help it. No. Suppose you're going to a government office, and that man says, you have to give me so much money to do your work for you. Now. That's not bribery, but that's extortion. That means that man is taking away from you money you, that you shouldn't be paying. That's extortion. So God is not going to hold me responsible for it. He's going to hold the other person responsible for it because he's forcibly taking money away from me to do what he's supposed to do when everything on my side is clean. My papers are clear. I'm just filing a paper. I just want work done, but he's pulling money out of me. That's his or sin, not mine. Right? Whereas if I go and pay money and say, hey, my papers are not in order, but I'm giving you money just past my, past my papers, that's corruption. That's me bri bribing a person. That's my sin, right? So understand the difference between bribery, corruption, and extortion. So corruption can be in different ways. And we don't engage in bribery, but sometimes extortion happens. And, uh, you know, it, uh, and, and, and then we are not responsible for it. And the good thing is, uh, 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 you know, in some parts of the world, uh, 
government itself is taking measures against corruption and against extortion. But the fact is, it is there. It is there in government. Another thing to think about is civil law and faith. Um, I believe that people of faith should and can be engaged in civil government. But when we go there, understand that we have to bring righteousness and justice, but we don't force our faith on people. That means if it's integrity, if it's honesty, if it's justice, we do it. But I can't go and say everybody has to read the Bible. Everybody, you know, especially in a secular government, the fact that a country is secular means we respect people of all faiths. We respect people of all persuasions. And we're going to do what is just, equitable, fair, righteous, honest for everyone. But we're not going to force our faith on people. Like everybody must go to church. Can't do that. And so uh, we have to understand. As believers, we must and we can, should be involved in civil government, but don't force your faith on people, especially in a secular government. We have to treat everybody with fairness and respect. So lastly, caste system, we know that's that's not right, simply because uh, uh, it demeans the value of people based on where they were born or who in which family they were born, and that's not right. In the eyes of God, everybody is equal. Um, the practice of dowry, again, uh, you know, if out of own free will, if people want to exchange gifts at a wedding, that's entirely their choice, but to, but to forcibly take money or demand money uh, in, the, in the context of a marriage, I feel it's wrong. Uh, if it's a free will, something free, people do freely, that's fine, but to forcibly take or Demand is wrong. Yoga, uh, I'm just making a comment here. It is a, it is connected. It has deep, deeply religious context. Uh, it is, while yoga in general has been presented as a form of exercise, its origins are deeply spiritual, and so we cannot uh, ignore its spiritual roots. So my response is, hey, if you want to do exercise, do exercise. You don't have to practice yoga. Uh, do whatever exercise you want, breathing exercises, sitting, stretching, do what exercise you want. But yoga in itself, in its original form, is an ex spiritual ex expression. And, uh, and so we stay away from that. So we've gone through, you know, quickly gone through a lot of different thoughts and ideas. Um, and uh, uh, the, the goal here is to give us a framework on how to think about things and uh, how we should respond to various things. Um, let's open up uh, a time for question and answers. Uh, let's pick up the questions here in the chat. Um, going back to our previous chapter on suffering, there's a couple of questions. How do we understand certain kind of sickness where death is in kind of inevitable, just a matter of time? And uh, it goes on, untimely death in the life of a servant of God or believers who lost their lives to COVID and similar. Now, one is, how do we respond to that? One is, we do not want to judge anyone, not even other believers, right? So uh, we shouldn't say if somebody, you know, goes, uh, dies in untimely death, whether through sickness or accident or, uh, you know, like people who lost their lives in COVID, uh, we shouldn't judge them and say, hey, there was some sin in their lives or God took them away. No, what is God's will? God's word is God's will. His word says that he, he wants to bless us with a long life. That's the will of God. Right? A long life is the will of God. But people do, do people die before their time? Yes, it happens all the time. Believers or unbelievers, so people die before their time. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so uh, it does happen, believers or unbelievers. Our response is don't judge them. Second, don't speculate. That means don't try to come up with some reasons or some you know answers. No, just accept the fact that 
we don't have the answers for every situation. In some situations, the untimely death could have been prevented. For example, during COVID, there were some, there were in some cases, if people had taken precautions, maybe they would not have died. I'm just guessing. I don't know. And if they had been more cautious, and maybe they exposed themselves, and maybe they died because of that. So could it have been avoided? Maybe, but we don't want to judge. So don't judge, don't speculate, and uh, since they are believers, we just thank God for their life, whatever life they've lived, and we know that they are in God's hands. Is it that God's will for them to die before their time? My answer is usually no, because um, uh, God's word says that he will satisfy us with a long life and show us his salvation. That's his word. Even if he spoke it once, that's what he means, and he's spoken it many times, right? Uh, that he will bless us with a long life. So that's his will. Do we fall short of it? Yes, we do. So we shouldn't change his will. We just say that we know there are a lot of things in this earth that cause untimely deaths. Uh, as you've seen already in this chapter on suffering, uh, we just leave it to God and glorify God for who he is. Uh, in spite of what has happened. That would be my response in situations like that. OK. Any other questions, please? Any questions on the social challenges? I know I went through it very quickly, um, but any questions on that? And how do you think through various situations, uh, various uh, challenges that we face? Okay, the class is very quiet today. Um, all right. Um, so we bring our, uh, you know, our our course to a conclusion. So in this course of Christian apologetics, we have actually gone through a very wide range of topics. Um, and I would encourage you to explore any topic that you want further that you might be interested in. We spent some time talking about God, the existence of God, creation, so on. Um, then, both from you know from a philosophical, scientific, biblical response to it. Then we spent some time talking about the Word of God itself, the Bible, how it came to us. Why we believe it's true. Then we spent some time, sorry, talking about the person of Jesus Christ, um, the uniqueness of Christ. How do we communicate Christ to a Hindu and a Muslim? And then we spent some time uh, talking about the aspect of suffering. And we closed off with just creating a framework to think about social issues. Um, we didn't address every social issue, but just said, OK, this is how we think about it. Look at it as how God looks. God would look at it and respond to that matter uh, from that perspective. So what I'm going to do is um, post uh, assessments for this. Uh, there will you know, it's just going to be covering all the content. It should take you not more than an hour or maximum two hours to do. And uh, you'll be graded based on the assessment. And yeah, so you have till the, I'll post it today, this afternoon, I'll, I'll work on it, post it. Uh, and you'll have time till next Friday. So about a week and a half to 
till the 24th to finish it. So you have plenty of time. You just need you just need about two hours to do it. Uh, it'll be an open book, open Bible assessment. So you can look at your notes, you can look at your Bible, but of course you'll have to do it independently. That means do it by yourself. Don't uh, discuss it with somebody. Yeah, that's the only 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 good strength. Any questions? Okay, there's a question in the chat. Well, we know homosexuality is sin. In today's world, there is an opinion that there are people who are created that way. What would the Christian way to respond to this? Um, I understand that that's part of the argument that I was born like this. It's in my genes or it's in my psyche, it's in my makeup, and that's why I have these tendencies. I have these tendency towards the same sex and so on. That's what some people might say. But one, we know in the Bible that God created male and female. Two, in the Bible, God condemns this kind of behavior or lifestyle. Or he says it's wrong. So, could there be an aberration of God's original design because of sin? Yes. So when people say, I have these tendencies or I have this propensity, could that be true? Yeah, it's true. But what's the root cause? Sin. Can God deliver people from it? Yes. Just when you look, example, you look at uh, any other sinful behavior like alcohol or stealing. A person in that, they, they say, look, I want to do this. Can God deliver that person? Yeah. So in the same way, he, but do they have the propensity? Do they want to do it? Yeah, they want to do it. So we're not denying that. But we're saying God can deliver. So that would be our response, that God created male and female. He has said homosexuality is wrong, so very clear. Third, could people have these tendencies and propensities and inclination? Yeah, because of sin. But just because they have it doesn't mean it's okay to do. No. The standard that we measure is the word of God. So what should our response? God can deliver. Just as in any other form of sin. That should be a response. And we should reach, we should try to reach out in love. Some people will accept it, some people will not. And nowadays there is even retaliation against um, the efforts to, you know, to see change in people. Uh, especially in the Western world, they even are against that, the Christian praying for people, for praying for deliverance, praying for wholeness and healing. They're against that. They, so, so if people are open, we can minister. If they don't want to receive that, don't want to receive ministry and deliverance, it's okay. We will not force it. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, if there are no other questions, we're going to close. And I just want to thank all of you for being part of this course, for journeying through this. I uh, apologize for some of the classes, some of the weeks that we missed uh, because of traveling and so on. But I hope uh, you found this uh, course informative, uh, helped you in thinking about certain things, and. Uh, if you have questions in the future, you're always welcome to reach out to any of our pastors and we'll do our best to try and answer. Okay? Can I please ask somebody to pray and then we will close, please? Get a new Jamaican and pray, please.
thing I can pray. Okay. Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for teaching us so many truths, Father God, and the topics that were covered in this course, Lord God. Father, you have given us this opportunity, Lord. Thank you. We praise you, Lord God. Father, even as uh, we're learning so many things, Lord God, Father, we pray for your wisdom and strength even in our personal lives, Lord God, how we have to follow these things, Lord God, even regarding social concerns and suffering, Father God. Father, you teach us, Lord God, give us your wisdom and guidance, Lord God, and pray, Lord God, that you will encourage each of us, Lord God, to follow the way that you want us to follow, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we also pray for Pastor, Lord. Father, we pray for healing, Lord, that whatever is the uh, is the suffering that he's going through right now, Lord God, the cold or the cough, Father, we pray for your healing. By your stripes, we are healed, Master God. Thank you, Lord. We pray a blessing over each of us, Lord God. Father, it is your choice that we are here, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to use whatever that we have learned here, Lord God, the way that you want us, Father God. Guide us and be with us, Lord God. In Jesus' mighty matchless name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being part of this course and journey together. Um, God bless you all. Uh, we'll see you again next semester. Thank you. Bye now.